study two tree diseases because trees have wants analogous to those of human beings they also have diseases similar to those which afflict human beings in many cases these diseases act like cancerous growths upon the human body in some instances the ailment may be a general failing due to improper feeding and in other cases it may be due to interference with the life processes of the tree how to tell an ailing tree whatever the cause an ailing tree will manifest its ailment by one or more symptoms a change of color in the leaves at a time when they should be perfectly green indicates that the tree is not growing under normal conditions possibly because of an insufficiency of moisture or light or an overdose of foreign grasses or salts withering of the leaves is another sign of irregularity in water supply dead tops point to some difficulty in the soil conditions or to some disease of the roots or branches spotted leaves and mushroom-like growths or brackets protruding from the bark are sure signs of disease in attempting to find out whether a tree is healthy or not one would therefore do well to consider whether the conditions under which it is growing are normal or not whether the tree is suitable for the location whether the soil is too dry or too wet whether the roots are deprived of their necessary water and air by an impenetrable cover of concrete or soil whether the soil is well drained and free from foreign gases and salts whether the tree is receiving plenty of light or is too much exposed and whether it is free from insects and fungi if after a thorough examination it is found that the ailment has gone too far it may not be wise to save the tree a timely removal of a tree badly infested with insects or fungi may often be the best procedure and may save many neighboring trees from contagious infection for this however no rules can be laid down and much will depend on the local conditions and the judgment and knowledge of the person concerned fungi as factors of disease the trees the shrubs and the flowers with which we are familiar are rooted in the ground and derive their food both from the soil and from the air there is however another group of plants the fungi the roots of which grow in trees and other plants and which obtain their food entirely from the trees or plants upon which they grow the fungi cannot manufacture their own food as other plants do and consequently absorb the food of their host eventually reducing it to dust the fungi are thus disease producing factors and the source of most of the diseases of trees when we can see fungi growing on a tree we may safely assume that they are already in an advanced state of development we generally discover their presence when their fruiting bodies appear on the surface of the tree these fruiting bodies are the familiar mushrooms puffballs toadstools or shelf-like brackets that one often sees on trees in some cases they spread over the surface of the wood in thin patches they vary in size from large bodies to mere pustules barely visible to the naked eye their variation in color is also significant ranging from colorless to black and red but never green they often emulate the color of the bark radiating from these fruiting bodies into the tissue of the tree are a large number of minute fibers comprising the mycelium of the fungus these fibers penetrate the body of the tree in all directions and absorb its food the mycelium is the most important part of the fungus growth if the fruiting body is removed soon another takes its place but if the entire mycelium is cut out the fungus will never come back the fruiting body of the fungus bears the seed or spores these spores are carried by the wind or insects to other trees where they take root in some wound or crevice of the bark and start a new infestation the infestation will be favored in its growth if the spore can find plenty of food water warmth and darkness as these conditions generally exist in wounds and cavities of trees it is wise to keep all wounds well covered with coal tar and to so drain the cavities that moisture cannot lodge in them this subject will be gone into more fully in the following two studies on pruning trees and tree repair while the majority of the fungi grow on the trunks and limb of trees some attack the leaves some the twigs and others the roots some fungi grow on living wood some on dead wood and some on both those that attack the living trees are the most dangerous from the standpoint of disease the chestnut disease the disease which is threatening the destruction of all the chestnut trees in america is a fungus which has within recent years assumed such vast proportions that it deserves special comment the fungus is known as diaporthe parasitica mural and was first observed in the vicinity of new york in 1905 at that time only a few trees were known to have been killed by this disease but now the disease has advanced over the whole chestnut area in the united states reaching as far south as virginia and as far west as buffalo the fungus attacks the cambium tissue underneath the bark it enters through a wound in the bark and sends its fungus threads from the point of infection all around the trunk until the latter is girdled and killed this may all happen within one season it is not until the tree has practically been destroyed that the disease makes its appearance on the surface of the bark in the form of brown patches studded with little pustules that carry the spores when once girdled the tree is killed above the point of infection and everything above dies while some of the twigs below may live until they are attacked individually by the disease or until the trunk below their origin is infected all species of chestnut trees are subject to the disease 
The Japanese and Spanish varieties appear to be highly resistant, but are not immune. Other species of trees besides chestnuts are not subject to the disease. There is no remedy or preventative for this disease. From the nature of its attack, which is on the inner layer of the tree, it is evident that all applications of fungicides, which must necessarily be applied to the outside of the tree, will not reach the disease. Injections are impossible, and other suggested remedies, such as boring holes in the wood for the purpose of inserting chemicals, are futile. The wood of the chestnut tree, within three or four years after its death, is still sound and may be used for telephone and telegraph poles, posts, railroad ties, lumber, and firewood. 